Josh Bumgarner with the Greater Tampa Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank the viewers for tuning in to our 2019 candidate interview series. Uh, we're interviewing today uh, for City Council at the City of Tampa. Chamber will focus on policy, not politics. And while we do not endorse uh, candidates, um, we want to make sure that we get their perspectives and their views in front of the business community. Um, we're excited today to have Walter Smith uh, running for City Council District 1. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we're uh, just under six weeks from election day. Um, and now that we're in the final stretch, can, can you give us uh, uh, a, a brief uh, insight into uh, what your message is to voters um, in the coming weeks before uh, they go to the polls? My concept has always been uh, bottom up representation uh, for, uh, from, from the community to government. And the, uh, the, the, the fact that we are one, the, the fact that we are one Tampa and that we uh, need to focus in on making certain that all people have a better quality of life. And uh, because we have seen in the past uh, few years that we've had a great amount of progress that's taking place at the core of the city, yet also at the core of the city, what we've also seen in terms of its dynamics is people who were pushed out to the outskirts of the city and they have they don't have the type of access uh, to jobs, access to uh, recreation and things of that nature uh, that everybody else does who are closer in. And so they have been ultimately, in essence, pushed out without any type of empowerment. And I think that one of the things that needs to happen is we need to have a lot of boots on the ground engagement with organizations like yours um, I spent 18 years of my life uh, as a civil and environmental engineering uh, uh, practice for years, um, working at dealing with training people, writing curriculum. I'm the only candidate actually who's been training and writing curriculum to get people back into jobs uh, in areas like OSHA, HASWAP or HAZMAT, 49 CFR, those things that credential people to go in effectively and get jobs. And they have been able to, it's been very, very helpful. What, when, what we have to do at the city level with regard to that economic growth is make certain that we are investing in that type of growth. Um, when we talk about the issue of business, we wanna make sure that we are, we are sustainable, that businesses are lasting. People go into business, they don't last very long. We wanna make sure that they are. So we have to make sure that the people have, that businesses have incentives to partner, that people have the ability to, to last right. and to survive. Yeah, yes. and, um, and we're going to touch on, on many of those issues, and uh, you start off with, with quality of life, and uh, an important component of quality of life is affordable housing, and so I want to chat about workforce housing, uh, which some consider a crisis uh, in, in, uh, in the city. There's certainly a need for more uh, workforce housing. Can you talk about any zoning or policy changes that you would implement to address this need? Well, you know, um one of the things that the first thing I would I would say needs to happen is we need to be in touch with the communities that uh, where this would happen, where it's necessary to have this housing. Uh, we can't just haphazardly go out there and say, oh, we're going to have housing right here. And no, we have to visit the communities, organize with the people that are there and uh, have the type of partnerships that exist uh, to make sure that we have effective and sustainable housing that is created. Um, so that we don't have any issues regarding that. Now, with, with regard to zoning, we have to look at the rules and regulations as they are right now and see what we may have to change in order to, if, if at all, to make certain that, again, that that housing is efficient, sustainable, and within the guidelines of the law um, uh, so, that, so that people are able to live effectively and, as I said before, with a better quality of life. People who have access to, to, uh, to uh, transportation, as we look at the, the transportation issue changing and transforming over time, we have to make certain that we're, that we're effectively doing those things that need to happen uh, that will make people successful. So I want to talk about the budget for a little bit. Uh, some would argue that the budget process is one of the biggest responsibilities of, of city council in working with the mayor. We're, we're uh, anticipating, at least some economists are anticipating a downturn in the economy in a couple of years, which would fall under uh, your tenure on city council if elected. How would you address the budget and the downturn in the economy? What, what cuts would you potentially look at? Would there be tax increases? How would you address that? Well, you know, in looking at the budget, we have to make sure that we are very, very careful uh, during time of, of during that period 
and make certain that uh, there, there are several factors that have to be considered. Uh, one is uh, we have to look at first responders, make sure that, they're, that they are uh, efficient and doing and have what they need in order to, uh, to do their job efficiently. Now, that ties into the issue of what we have going on in terms of climate change and, and environmental issues and things like that that may happen. We're in Florida, hurricanes happen, storms happen. When, when, one of the things that happens in the city of Tampa is we have to have these people be able to offer these services, and that's just an example, of, mind you. Uh, they have to be able to offer these services effectively. We cannot shortchange them as far as that's concerned. What we also have to make sure of is that we are addressing the issue in terms of the budget of, um, of putting money where it's needed, where it is most needed. And that's going, to, that's going to take making certain that we are going through this thing with a fine tooth comb, that we are also engaging communities to make sure of what their needs are currently and what they will be in those particular time periods of emergency and need. Uh, and make sure that we are, we are putting things away and storing things that we need in order to be able to um, uh, properly address those issues when the time comes, if that will, when that happens, because that's, that's almost inevitable that that will happen with the type of things we're seeing right now with the economy. Uh, you know, it goes through changes. We will see those changes and we have to prepare ourselves appropriately, but that has to happen. That's one of the main things we want to, want to make sure happens right. that they are secure, but also we want to make, because they have to be able to protect the people. Right. And the people have to make, the people have to also be very secure in terms of, uh, in terms of access to uh, medical needs and things of that nature. And we have to make sure that those priorities are handled first and foremost. So we have to really um, take a look at those uh, holistically right. when it comes down to it. Uh, and I'm gonna chat about permitting real quick. There seems to be some growing frustrations um, and difficulty in the permitting process in the city. Um, we've heard from, from some of our members and, and folks in the community we obviously we want to make sure it's a safe process permitting, but it also needs to be an efficient one for, for businesses and residents in the city. How would you address uh, the permitting process if elected? Get rid of those things that, that are just frivolous um, frivolous points in, in the process. I, really, we have to go through that process appropriately and work with the chamber, work with uh, businesses, the business community, and find out what, what, what's unnecessary. We have developers right now who, who, started, who started out uh, doing jobs and had to stop, just back right out of it. And the reason they backed out of it was because there's, there's too much red tape. That hurts our economy. That hurts us badly uh, because that is, that is uh, infrastructural work. That is uh, work that has to be done in terms of buildings and, and resources and recreation and things like that that could really help our tourism in a big way. But when people back out because there's too much permitting going on, you know, that, that doesn't help anything. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the fact that with, with parking, for instance, right, you have the builders that are, that are, that are really not happy with some of the things that happen and, and the, the, uh, um, the difficult time they have in trying to get that done. When I was on the Barrio Latino Commission, you know, I looked at some of the stuff that was going on and I was like, wow, you know, that. And I spent four years on the commission and I watched that happen. I'm a member of the West Tampa CRA Community Advisory Council. And we have a heck of a time uh, going through those things with a fine tooth comb to make certain that we can tr to understand how that works. Now, being in the engineering field, I see it all the time. Uh, I teach right now in the classroom as a science teacher, but on the side, I still consult, you know. And I, I can tell you right now, I do land use and things like that all the time. And I see the difficulties that, that people are going through. I was a safety manager, safety engineer and manager for, uh, for the, the, um, uh, arm, the uh, uh, armature works. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw, I saw some difficulties there uh, in the surrounding area, in the surrounding area, right? And people that wanted to add more and they just backed right out. Okay. You know, same thing downtown, they went in and backed right out. We've got to do something that, that brings them in, but keeps them in and, but, but we got to make sure the process is efficient, not uh, not uh, overly, uh, uh, not over permitting and things like that. But we have to be careful that we're not rubber stamp, right. that we're not giving people a rubber stamp just to be building and it's and it's no good for anybody. Yeah, 
there's certainly mm -hmm. a balance there that needs to be struck. And there has to be a balance. Um, moving to, to home rule, I want to talk a little bit about preemption. Local governments across the state um, continue to grow frustrated that there's there seems to be a, a Tallahassee knows best mentality coming from the state legislature. Uh, do you agree that that's the case? If so, how would you work to build a stronger relationship, productive relationship with our state delegation? Well, you know, um, I, I do have a good relationship with a lot of state representatives uh, and people who uh, who work in Tallahassee. We have to build that those relationships across the aisle. It's many of the things that we deal with should not even be partisan, right? They're just, they're people issues. And when we start looking at the issue of things like gun control, which is one of the biggest preemption issues that we face right now, um, that should not be, uh, truthfully, that really should not be uh, a, a political issue. That should be a people issue, right? You know, uh, I believe in protecting myself, I, I, just like anybody else does. But, you know, I, I, I protect myself with common sense, you know? Uh, and, and, and when it comes down to preemption, one of the things that, uh, that goes hand in hand with working with those people who are lawmakers in Tallahassee is also the concept that we have to work hand in hand with the community. It cannot be trickled down. It has to be hand in hand with the community and local resources uh, and institutions in order to get those rules and regulations uh, going ahead of ahead of pre to beat preemption. Now, given that preemption is is if it's set, it's set. Well, that means now that locally we can't we can't do anything in city council except now that's in chambers. But I always say to people, my job does not begin and end in city council chambers. It begins and ends with people. So that means that I'm going to the chamber of commerce. That means I'm going to uh, South Tampa, North Tampa, all those communities, and and working with these people citywide in order to make certain that we are addressing those issues efficiently. That and there's buy-in from the people. If we don't have buy-in from the people, we're going to get pushback. We get pushback, that's just textbook, we're going to have a problem. And so we, we're, when you talk about preemption, we have to be on agreement and in agreement that we are able to defend our city, that we're able to defend ourselves. And I'm not, I'm not talking about guns. I'm, you know, when I say defend, I mean defend our rights as sovereign citizens of the city of Tampa yeah. and Hillsborough County and so forth. We have to be able to do that. They would tie our hands with everything and we wouldn't be able to do business, we wouldn't be able to do anything if we allow preemption to, do, to take over. So right. we have to work with communities to, okay. um, to do that and organize. Absolutely, and um, you know, a lot of the things you talked about were essential partnerships. And so I wanna move into economic development and, and specifically public-private partnerships, P3s. Um, they are an asset for local governments across the country. Uh, what opportunities do you see for public-private partnerships in the city of Tampa? Uh, anything specific or just overall? Overall, or, or specific projects, or yeah. uh, public public private uh, partnerships are are critical, critical. Uh, and I'll give you a perfect example. I have met with the members of of the administration for the, the Port of Tampa, um, and, and and I've worked with uh, the port uh, directly from the standpoint of having people get into jobs. Now, the reason that, that I mentioned that is because I'm the only candidate, and I can say this truthfully and, and you can check the record, I'm the only candidate that has actually written and trained people to go into jobs, hundreds of them, at the port, airport, engineering firms, construction companies, the whole nine. That requires partnerships and effective partnerships that are sustainable. You notice, notice you hear me constantly use the word sustainable, right? Because we have to build a very sustainable city. Now, when we start talking about building a sustainable city, it does take those partnerships, private and public. Now, that means that that means that when you talk about the concept of working with of working with the city, uh, you know, is, is there something that that that's missing? Yes. What's missing is the people, right? So, what am I doing? I am creating a partnership with the people, with the business community, and with the city that says now that we have a trilateral agreement. That agreement, that agreement is the best type of agreement to possibly have in terms of partnerships. Uh, because you don't get a pushback, you don't have a failure, uh, commonly anyway. Um, and, and, and everybody seems to be on the same page. Now, when you talk, to give you an example of something. 
uh, when I when I do this type of thing and work with people to get jobs, uh, they last. And the reason they last as long as they do is because there is a uh, a monitoring process, right? It's part of the partnership. And when you talk about the concept of making certain that that things that, that things work, well, you know, how are we going to get people into these jobs, right? Well, you know, there has to be an agreement with the trainer. It could be HCC, it could be me, it could be the high tech, it could be any of these groups of people that are making certain that, 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 that we are training people to go in to do their part to get people ready for these jobs that are coming into the city. Right. If we don't do that properly, then it fails, right? Now, we have to have the businesses and the chamber that, that helps us to bring businesses in and make that connection with businesses that are willing to take these people in and prepare these people and identify through outreach with communities to make certain there's a connection there. Now, if you're talking about uh, public public engagement, you're talking about the uh, the issue of using maybe the airport, or talking about the airport, getting people jobs at the airport, port, and so forth. Well, you know, same type of thing. That partnership has to be effective, and so that so that we're not uh, we're not wasting our time, and so that we're not losing economically. We will lose economically if we have a brain drain if we don't make these partnerships work. We have to leave, leave and look for other people from out of town to come in and take these jobs. And the people that are here are going to continue to leave to take jobs because they can't, they can't work. Okay. So yeah, that's how really partnerships good. work, just as an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about connectivity. Obviously, transportation is a big part of that. Um, just in November, a transportation referendum supported by the chamber passed, injecting new dollars into transportation. Uh, we all have transportation lists of projects we'd like to see get done. However, I want to ask you, with these new transportation dollars, if elected, out of the gate, what would be the one priority transportation project you would like to see get done? You know, one of the main things I want to see done, I, I, I love, you know, it's hard to say. There's so much in the transportation bit that's up, and it's hard to say because I've seen the buses not go through uh, critical areas like Sulphur Springs where people can get the jobs. That's critical. we got to get that going. Uh, we need to make sure that alternatively, uh, no, it, it, uh, inclusively, uh, that that we that we're that we're investing in the type of buses that are going to make clean air, uh, electrical buses, for instance, right? But I digress. That's just one aspect of, of what we're talking about here. So we talk about connectivity. Yes, that is part of the connectivity portion. Um, uh, getting the rail lines, the CSX lines, and those those rail lines that are just sitting there, we got to get those moving. We gotta get those moving. We gotta use them because what that does ultimately is that forces us now, uh, because it trickles down from the county to us, that forces us now to make rules and regulations and to engage the community now on the issue of development and revitalization. We have to make certain that those tracks, see those tracks have nodes, they stop in different communities. They pass through communities and those are critical communities. Many of those communities are poor. And those communities and those people need to be able to get from point A to point B to get to work. But you also have the type of connectivity from university, from New Tampa, North Tampa, and places like that to get to the city, to the core. That is going to be the critical point, and that's why connectivity, the, the connectivity part is so important. We've got to get those tracks working. Um, that's just one. So I, I got to, you know, I want to be fair. Uh, yeah, okay. that, that priority project, and, and we appreciate you know, giving that to us. I I want to chat a little about leadership. Um, what do you see as the role of, of Tampa City Council, and how do you see that evolving um, over the duration of your term if elected? You know what? I've worked, um, I've worked with City Council to do a lot of things in the community citywide. When I say the community, I mean Tampa as a whole. Um, and that's how I see it. Uh, it is critical for us to recognize that Tampa is a very diverse city yet it is very well, very much segregated. Uh, segregated not just by race and ethnicity, no, but also by economics, social status, and so forth. All these things, uh, all these things are things that we have to take a look at and work to recondition the city and its people um, to, to make a better, better city. Now, the role, that, that's our role as role models and as representatives throughout the city, uh, as goodwill representatives, by the way. My, using the word goodwill, okay? 
Uh, then we look at the at the at the issue of our relationship with the mayor. Our relationship with the mayor is one of checks and balances, and must be a very good relationship, respectful relationship. And we have to make sure that we're able to work together to in order, in order to make certain that we are doing what we need to do, not inside, not just inside of chambers, as I said earlier, but also in the community. Right. A boots on the ground engagement that helps us to be able to funnel concepts and ideas to the mayor and make good decisions together. Now, if we can, if, if we can do that, then we will have we will have succeeded. Those partnerships that we talked about earlier, it all it's all connected. It's all very much connected. I've worked with the Barrio Latino Commission, uh, the West Tampa CRA, C, uh, uh, Community Advisory Council. I've worked at East Tampa as, you know, as environmental advisor and with their partnership, done brownfields projects and revitalization projects throughout the city of Tampa. Okay. And I can tell you right now, um, you know, when you look at the, at the bigger picture, I've worked both privately and publicly, and I can tell you right now, it works. It would work well if we, if we could do that. And that is the role to make certain that we're using money properly, monitoring that properly, um, and that we are uh, putting it where it needs to be so that it's working and sustainably for the city. Great. So we touched on several policy topics. Is there something that we didn't touch on as a priority of your campaign or something you'd like to reemphasize? You know what? Um, there is something that, that, that we need to really, really focus in on. Um, and that is the concept of the uh, of homelessness, right? Uh, we have a, a large homeless population in Tampa, very large homeless population and in, in the Tampa Bay area. And we have got to work on that because for us, we might say, well, it's a homeless problem, but really it's a homeless crisis because what starts out as a problem ends up being a crisis if we're not focusing in on it in order to make certain that, that we're addressing it. That means that there are resources that when, when you deal with the homeless population, you're dealing with a population that uses more, uh, more, uses the, uh, uh, uses more resources than those who are not, okay? Uh, you, you talk about safety issues, you talk about illnesses, you're talking about uh, police, fire and so forth. You know, that's a problem, okay? And we need to make certain that these people are working, uh, that they're getting the proper care that they need in terms of mental health in many instances. Um, I know that uh, the, the, the Public Defender's Office has worked uh, very closely with the Sheriff's Department and with TPD to create a program that certifies them in being able to train, able, able to identify when somebody has a mental health issue and what to do with that. Uh, you know, we have to make certain that they're not criminalized. Okay. We, we don't. We don't want that. We want to help these people as much as possible. Uh, I've done as much as I can on my end, and continue to do what I can through taking people, training them, uh, personally training them many, many times for free. You know, uh, it, it, certainly homeless people. You know, I've trained them for free, absolutely. But uh, uh, training these folks and making sure that, that I can do what I can making sure that we're getting clothing in uh, to them so they, they have something that can keep them warm in these cold nights and keep them right. protected. Right. Uh, but it's something that we really cannot continue to overlook, but we have to have some policies in place that work. Okay. And that is something that, uh, that they'll really need to pay attention to. Great. So uh, where can viewers go to learn more about your campaign? Uh, you can check out uh, my campaign at uh, WalterForTampa.com. That's WalterForTampa.com, and uh, you can also check out my Facebook page, which is also under Walter for Tampa. Uh, and uh, you can you can check me out there. I do videos ever so often uh, where I explain what it is that's going on, recap some of the, the issues of the day, and uh, it's very interactive. And uh, I just want to make certain that people understand that, um, you know, this, these are some critical issues that critical times that we're in. We're in a great time from one perspective because we're seeing a lot of growth, but we also have a lot of areas that are suffering and people who, who deserve to have a better quality of life. And so, uh, uh, you know, we, we have the issue of affordable housing that needs to be addressed and all these other issues that we can't cover in this, this short time period. But I'd love to, Lord knows I want to, 
but I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you like this and do this interview. Uh, and uh, yep. I look forward to being on council. Great. And uh, on behalf of uh, our 1,400 members, our board of directors, thanks for joining us and thanks for your willingness to serve in, in elected office. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you now. Thank you.